We've said before on this podcast that translating Bibles can be like making sausages. A peek behind the curtain of the process can reveal some unpleasant realities. But part of my goal is to cut through any saccharine veneer that people might have in their minds and help them understand what doesn't always get talked about. I especially want people interested in serving in Bible translation to get a clearer picture of what they may face so that they can count the cost. We've talked a lot about the joys of Bible translation, and they're real. But today we're going to dip into some things that may be disillusioning or disenchanting. I'm Andrew Case, and you're listening to Working for the Word. Now, before we get into the challenging things we're going to talk about today, I want to say something for the record, because a lot of people ask me about becoming translation consultants and how they can be involved in that. So I just want to say something real quick, just a word of advice. If you are interested in contributing to the world of Bible translation as a translation consultant, hear me out. If you don't have an eye for detail you shouldn't really entertain this idea. I see people now and then that want to help in this capacity, and that's great. But although they might have some good training and knowledge that they bring to the table, they don't have eagle eyes. They can't spot big or small mistakes, even in their own language. They're not meticulous. They don't catch typos. So if that's you, I would just say lovingly, that this isn't the job for you. You need laser eyes of an editor or proofreader that will catch mistakes no one else did. You have to be a perfectionist when it comes to punctuation and all sorts of other things. If you're not, there are lots of other ways you can serve Bible translation, but being a consultant really isn't for you. Of course, I don't want to discourage anybody, but sometimes we just need to recognize the gifts that God has given us or hasn't given us, and go invest in those things that are our strengths. Okay, so with that said, let's get into the first thing I want to talk about that may be a little surprising or disappointing for a consultant or somebody serving in Bible translation. And we're going to start with a somewhat lighthearted one. So here's the thing. Sometimes you end up talking and thinking for hours about poop. And not only poop, but things like nocturnal emissions or mutilated testicles and having long, drawn-out conversations about these sorts of things. Now, just yesterday, we were checking the Mistec translation of Deuteronomy 23. So let me just refresh your memory on what this chapter is about. Let's start with verse 1 in the ESV. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. No one born of a forbidden union may enter the assembly of Yahweh. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants may enter the assembly of Yahweh. Moving down to verse 9. When you are encamped against your enemies, then you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. If any man among you becomes unclean because of a nocturnal emission, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp, but when evening comes, he shall bathe himself in water, and as the sun sets, he may come inside the camp. You shall have a place outside the camp, and you shall go out to it. Now, this is an interesting verse. Verse 12, the ESV translates it very ambiguously, just as the Hebrew has it. It's actually talking about a place to go to the bathroom. Verse 13, and you shall have a trowel with your tools, and when you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it, and turn back and cover up your excrement. So, Let me share just a couple tidbits from our long, drawn-out conversation about these verses as we were checking them. The first verse, no one whose testicles are crushed, 
or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. Now, they didn't actually have this correct. They had a translation that was communicating that somebody's testicles were rotting in some way, kind of like fruit gone bad that's like extra soft. And that's the kind of wording that they were using to communicate what was going on with these testicles. (laughs) And so we had to get into explaining and researching this. This was really talking about somebody whose testicles had been crushed or damaged in some kind of battle or accident. And then, of course, you have to decide how you're going to deal with the second part of the verse. Are you going to use a euphemism? Or are you going to say it straight out? What's most appropriate culturally? Now, the Hebrew doesn't really give us any guidance here because it uses a hapax legomenon, a word that only occurs here, which is shofcha, or as Abraham Shmuelov, the famous Sephardic reader, pronounces it, shafcha. So, I'm not sure why he does that. But anyway, this is an extremely rare word, and so we don't really know if it was a polite way of talking about this sort of thing or a really direct kind of technical way of talking about it. So it's really interesting to see what different versions have done with this over the years. The KJV says, or hath his privy member cut off, which is pretty hysterical. NASB says his male organ... NIV really tiptoes around this one, and they say, no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. So, it's interesting that they just say, emasculated by crushing or cutting. So, you basically have to mentally fill in the blank what was cut off. So, then in verse 2, it says, no one born of a forbidden union may enter the assembly of Yahweh. So we had to talk about what is a forbidden union referring to here? What exactly? Is it just somebody who was born out of wedlock, a bastard child, or is it trying to communicate something else more specific? Now, once again, the Hebrew is difficult here. It's mamzer, which only occurs here and in Zechariah 9.6. And so the precise meaning is disputed. And Some people think, well, it could maybe refer to a man born of an incestuous union, which is discussed in Leviticus 18, 6 through 18, or this could be a Jewish male whose mother was a Gentile, which is talked about in Nehemiah 13, 23 through 25, or some people think that this could be referring to people born out of cult prostitution. So that's a tricky one, even though on the surface it may seem like it would have been a no-brainer. Now, next we have verse 10. If any man among you becomes unclean because of a nocturnal emission, then he shall go outside the camp. This did not make any sense in the translation. And the lady I was working with had no idea what it was talking about in the draft that she had in front of her. And so basically at this point, I was like, I think what would be best is to go to some people in the community that really know the language and ask them what the best euphemism for this sort of thing would be in their language. And then finally, we got to verse 12. You shall have a place outside the camp and you shall go out to it. That's exactly what the Hebrew says. It doesn't say what this place is for. Now, There's different translations that do different things with this to try to make it more explicit because it seems to be implying that this is a place to go to the bathroom. So let's check out a smattering of these. New International Version says, Designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. New Living also says relieve yourself. And then the King James, just for kicks, says, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad. (laughs) So, then we have the Aramaic Bible in plain English, which says, And a place shall be known to you outside of the camp, and let out there the waters of your legs. And then we have the Dewey Rhymes Bible, Thou shalt have a place without the camp to which thou mayest go for the necessities of nature, 
Which brings me to what happened in this particular translation we were checking. There's a Spanish version, the Dios habla hoy, which is kind of like the NLT. And this had a euphemism in Spanish, which we also use in English to take care of your necessities. And so the Spanish version had this, and they basically copied that idiom or euphemism directly into their language, where it did not mean that at all. Now, of course, they have their own euphemism for going to the bathroom, which is basically going to the bush. So we had to fix that verse. All this to say that Bible translation is not always glamorous. Consulting can sometimes lead you into long conversations about male organs and poop and bastards and all sorts of other wonderful things. And sometimes you just walk away and you wonder, man, what am I doing with my life? Now, this was a kind of a lighthearted one, but now we're going to talk about some things that many people refuse to talk about. As many of you may already know, the world of missions is often presented through a filter to people so that it seems more glamorous than it is, just as we're all used to now because we're all actively engaged in doing the same thing on social media. Mission organizations often vet newsletters before they go out so that nothing too negative is shared, and they have actual written rules about this sort of thing. You can't be too honest like the book of Lamentations, for example, in your newsletters, because that doesn't keep people giving. People want to hear the peppy cotton candy side of ministry so that they'll give. So you rarely hear about the darker side of Bible translation. But there is one, just as there is to everything in a sinful, broken world subjected to futility. So, the next one I want to talk about is that checking translations is often like grading homework. Homework that was done poorly. If you've ever taught a class, you know that grading is not fun. It's probably a teacher's least favorite thing to do. But it has to be done in most cases. So, here are some of the reasons consulting a translation can end up being so painfully tedious because of poor work because of poor drafts presented to you. So, number one is because you had no say as a consultant in the preparation of the translators you're working with. Training often gets scheduled and planned out without consulting the consultant on the project. Sometimes that's because they just don't know who the consultant is going to be yet. So, they get a jump on the other stuff, like training, before they finally find a consultant. It's not supposed to be that way, but life happens and things fall through the cracks and we have bottlenecks and lack of communication happens. And by the way, the world of Bible translation, in my experience, has been one of the most spectacular examples of bad communication that history has ever seen. So when translators miss the training they need because the consultant didn't have a say in what they needed beforehand, poor drafts result. And then it's a lot of cleanup work that lands in your lap. Now, number two is that everyone's in a rush. This overlaps with the first one a bit. Donors are in a rush. The world is in a big hurry because it's the 21st century and we think lots of money can make everything happen fast right now. Bible translation is no exception. So many times, essential preparation gets pared down, people cut corners, and training gets crammed down translators' throats so fast that they remember very little. So their translations suffer, and the consultant then has a bunch of unpleasant grading to do. Now, the third reason this can happen is because of cultural issues and just general laziness. There's no use in lying to ourselves that we don't all struggle with laziness. And this is across cultures. Sometimes translators look at their schedule and they see that they need to produce a first draft by such and such a date. And since it's the first draft, the temptation is to take that to mean just get anything down on paper or in the computer and then rely on the consultant to fix it. 
Since they know the consultant is going to check it at the end of the day, then they're tempted to let things slide more than they would if they were the only ones who had to give the ultimate account for the publication, right? And this is, of course, a universal temptation for everyone throughout history is to pass the buck, you know? If somebody else is going to do some more work on this, then, well, I can lean more heavily on that person down the line. So the consultant is given this work, which may not be their best work, but he has no way of knowing. And on top of that, he doesn't want to offend them or insult their intelligence, right? So he just girds up his loins and makes the best of it. He's usually from another culture. So he wants to tread carefully and be as respectful as possible. And that's a good thing. So when he probably should have said to them, please go back and overhaul this entire book while paying attention to such and such issues, he ends up spending way more time than he should have correcting careless or low-level mistakes. This is extremely inefficient, and in the long run, that translation won't be as good as it would have been if he had asked them to redo it, and in the end, those translators don't learn as much as they could have from their mistakes because they didn't have to redo the whole thing. But asking them to redo something like that might not only be a bad clash, but it also might simply be discouraging to them. And no one wants to be that guy. You know, that's legit. This is also aggravated by the fact that many translation projects have deadlines. Deadlines they need to meet in order to secure funding for the future. So the pressure is on, and so quality will often get sacrificed on the altar of haste. And compromise is just never fun for anyone, especially the consultant. Because as I mentioned earlier, consultants are usually perfectionists, and they really want to help people present their best work to their community. Now, finally, because consulting is often like grading bad homework for some of these reasons— This can lead to burnout and just straight-up discouragement. Nobody wants to feel like their years of training has boiled down to catching super careless mistakes that aren't even related to a knowledge of the Bible or biblical languages. But that's what often happens. Now, moving on to another part of the sausage factory. Consulting can be unhealthy for you spiritually. Hear me out. If you're spending hours each day going through translations of the Bible with a fine-tooth comb looking for mistakes, instead of enjoying and delighting in it, it can really wear on your soul and your experience of Scripture. Many times you'll come away feeling frustrated that such difficult things had to be in Scripture, which has made the task of translation so ridiculously hard. So many of the things Jesus said are insanely hard to understand, much less translate. And then it becomes hard to turn off the translation analyzer side of your brain when you're reading God's Word for its own sake. So if you are interested in going into this kind of work, count the cost and go in with your eyes wide open to this danger. Because it's real, and I don't think enough people are made aware of it. The next area of the sausage factory is that consulting can be discouraging because of language limitations. If you're a writer like me, with a mother tongue like English, which is a language extraordinarily rich in vocabulary, And if you're like me, with a strong desire to see things written well and communicated with the same impressive artistry of the biblical authors, then translation consulting can be a massive letdown a lot of the time. The thing is, most of the grand, immense languages like Chinese already have Bible translations. The ones that are left are usually languages that have been watered down by colonialism and globalization, which we've talked about before. Thousands of beautiful words have been lost over the last few centuries, along with a lot of idioms and euphemisms, metaphors, proverbs, and just 
cultural heritage. These languages are a shadow of what they once were, which means their Bible translation isn't going to be the work of art you hoped for and dreamed of. Half the time you're going to run into things there aren't words for. Even things you'd think were basic and elemental to every language. My theory is that this often happens because the richness of the language has been ruined by colonialism and globalization, but there are also many cultural factors that come into play as well as other things that make it hard to translate concepts and poetry that are dear to your heart as a Bible lover. So many times you end up feeling like you're having to settle or compromise and the beauty of God's word has been stripped from it. This may not always be the case from their perspective, of course. They may think it sounds great as native speakers, but since I can only see it through a back translation, it can really be depressing. I work with one language that lacks many terms and simple words for things like priest or prophet, so they've chosen to use long descriptive phrases. So when I see over and over the one who works in the house of God or the one who speaks on behalf of God or something like that, every time the words priest or prophet occur, it just feels like hearing nails on a chalkboard to me. Many of these decisions end up being things we're stuck with because of traditions or because they already did a New Testament a long time ago and have established a lot of key terms that may or not be the best. Another way I might describe reading many back translations is that it's like seeing a beautiful painting that you love reproduced in black and white by a painter who lost his glasses. Now, on the flip side of this, people love to talk about the ways that back translations enrich our understanding of the biblical text and give us exciting new ways to think about it. But I've found that these sorts of epiphanies are the exception to the rule of what I just described. When someone gets to work with a remarkable language that has all the right vocabulary ready to rock, then those are the people who write a great book about their experience that inspires people to go into Bible translation. But then the reality sets in and you realize it's not all peaches and cream. So this is just me trying to be honest and clear about what can be the disappointing or discouraging side of something that also has its own particular joys. So I'm not going to exaggerate and say that it's always this way, but once again, I think it's healthy for everyone to be aware of the kinds of things that they will face and go in with their eyes wide open and have realistic expectations. Okay, so moving on down into the sausage factory. Consulting can be discouraging because you get to do all the grading of this homework, but then you don't get to reap the benefits of what you're doing, which is delighting in the word of God in that language for the first time. This is what the communities the translation is for get to do. They get to delight in the word of God in their language for the first time, but you don't after all of that work. The native speakers get to enjoy all these fruits of your labor and the team's labor, but you often will never hear any testimonials or very few. This is because real life doesn't have a comments section. And most people are like the healed lepers who didn't come back to thank Jesus. This also may be because you end up working with a culture that is more shy about expressing deep things of the heart openly. They may feel profound gratitude and joy, but you'll never hear about it. Another potential discouragement down in the factory is that consulting can be hard because once in a while you'll hear comments that make you wonder if everything you're doing is in vain. So the other day, my wife and I were talking with one translator on a team we work with, and she was telling us how hard it was to find just one kid in the whole people group who spoke the language well enough to participate in a literacy video they were putting together. So you can imagine this was alarming because it made it sound like the language would be dead within a generation and the entire translation would never be used by them. 
that's not the kind of thing you want to hear, ever. It makes you want to give up, and it makes you question whether people were being honest about the vitality of the language when you accepted the project in the first place. Now, thankfully, in that particular instance, things have been cleared up, and now I feel a little more comforted by some other things people have told me about the realities of the next generation and the language vitality. But for a while there, I really felt down and just like, what is going on? What is going on? Why am I doing this? Now, of course, people might respond, well, you know, you should be happy and, and thankful that you're getting to impact at least even one generation, even if it doesn't impact any more generations after them. And that's true, of course. But the reality that I'm trying not to hide is that at the end of the day, we want to leave a legacy in Bible translation. And no matter how you try to soften the blow of news like that, it's still going to be discouraging. Now, the last thing we're going to touch on is money issues. We're going to do a full episode about money sometime in the future, money and Bible translation, some other time. But let me mention a few things here. Money makes Bible translation messy, just as much as it makes life messy, right? It tempts people It can warp motivations. Sometimes Bible translators end up doing Bible translation because it's a job that pays well and seems better than working in a field. I've worked with translators who admitted to me that they took longer to translate Genesis on purpose because they were getting paid by the hour. So the longer it took, the longer they would be guaranteed a paycheck. Even though it wasn't called a paycheck, it was just called an offering, but it was the same kind of idea. Of course, this brings up a lot of solutions and critiques people have regarding this whole issue, and I've heard them all, but we won't get into those right now. The point is that sometimes when lots of money from big fundraising organizations like Wycliffe is involved, there are temptations for everyone, including just the simple temptation of trusting in the power of money to make things happen and get things done more than God. We all struggle with that every day. Now, thankfully, there are safeguards in place to avoid some of these pitfalls, and I'm grateful that bad stories in this arena are the exception, but it can get complicated. Money can poison relationships. One of the areas where money became a discouraging issue for me was when SIL began charging other organizations for my services as a consultant. Now, I was never asked for permission to do this, and I was never given an option to have them not charge for my services. So, if I was checking a book, for example, I had to report how many hours I spent on that book, and then SIL would charge the project's funding organization, or budget, for about $16 per hour of my work. Of course, I didn't see this money. It's not like they sent me a check or anything. They said that this got sent to SIL for administration fees and to cover the bills. To me, this is really like Paul telling Timothy's church that they needed to pay him, Paul, for every sermon that Timothy preached and not pay Timothy. I was fully funded by sacrificial donors so that all of my time could be volunteered, just like any missionary. But SIL was charging money for my work with the justification that it was to help pay administrative costs. So this was discouraging. Other people may think that's silly for me to be discouraged about this. Other people may think it's shockingly foolish of me to even bring this up, Uh, but it was discouraging, especially when I discovered that even if a project were to be funded purely by Mexican donors or, you know, fill in the blank from the country, because the goal is always to make translation projects in other countries sustainable and mainly supported by Christians and communities in that country and not always be dependent on the outside. And so, I found out that even if a project were funded purely by Mexican donors, SIL would still charge for my services. So, you know, if you're not comfortable 
with your mission being run more like a corporation, which, which I'm not really comfortable with, this kind of stuff is depressing and can make you want to quit. It can make you jaded. And I'm not here to condemn anyone or, or judge anyone for this or to complain. I've heard all the explanations in the book for this relatively new policy, but I'm still not comfortable with it, and it still depresses me. Just being honest here. So all of this to say, if you are looking to go into Bible translation in a similar capacity to mine, I would just encourage you pastorally to think carefully about these things, to weigh them in the balance, to think through them biblically, and ask for some other people's perspectives as well. Get a a well-rounded idea of what you're getting into. Count the cost well. Once again, my perspective is my perspective, and it's not the experience of everyone. Some people may have had the peaches and cream experience their whole time in ministry, and that's awesome. But I would say that's probably not the rule. Other people may hear me talking about these things and say, wow, you've lived a charmed life, buddy. (laughs) That's nothing compared to what I've seen. So everyone has their own experience, and this is what we do as Christians. We learn from each other. We learn from what we've seen. We try to challenge each other and sharpen each other to be more biblical. And we also encourage each other to do difficult things for the glory of God, and to hope in God when things are hard. So that about wraps it up for now. Thank you for listening. And thank you so much, all of you who wrote to enter the Tyndale Greek New Testament Introduction Contest. And some of you wrote some very encouraging words, and I really, really appreciate it. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help us all treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.